GT7 has been out for a while now, and man, it's actually pretty hard. Your first few hours will likely involve a bit of this. And a whole lot of this. GT7 feels different from all previous GT games. Clearly, something has changed in the physics. But what exactly? Let's put GT7 to the test and find out. With all the tail out action in GT7, your first thought might be that the tires have less grip than they used to. It's the logical conclusion, so let's put that one under some scrutiny first. We are using Special Stage Root X for our straight line tests and our weapon of choice is the GR Supra RZ20. Its stats and tires are identical in both games, so it's the perfect candidate for a comparison car. Slow-mo off the line, you can see that even though we are off the handbrake earlier in GT7, the GT Sport car is accelerating away. As we cross the 100 meter mark, the GT Sport car has a nice 6 km per hour lead. But only 100 meters later, this is cut to half with just a 3 km per hour lead and by the 400 meter mark, it's down to just 1 km per hour difference in speed. After the good initial launch for GT Sport, the GT7 car is closing right in. This continues until the 1100 meter marker when something strange happens. If we stop the action right here, the cars are even in speed. But now the GT Sport Supra starts to pull away again. By the 3000 meter mark, the GT Sport Supra is maintaining a 7 km per hour lead. But there's that hill ahead. By the top of the hill, that 7k lead is down to only 3. But what goes up must come down, and that lead that was shrinking fast is now growing faster than ever. If we call it a day at the 6000 meter mark, we can see the GT Sport Supra taking the win with a 10 km per hour difference in speed. Now that was all over the show. GT Sport was in the lead, then GT7 came back, then GT Sport kicked again. What could cause that brand of crazy? Off the line, the GT Sport car had the edge. So let's say that had the grippier tires. Then the GT7 Supra appeared to accelerate faster once out of that initial traction phase. So let's say that has more raw horsepower and torque. But at high speed, the GT Sport car came back. What could that be about if it has less power? Maybe the air is thinner in GT Sport? If that were the case, the GT Sport Supra would be able to reach higher speeds with less power. So it makes sense on that level. To back this up, we see the GT Sport Supra lose speed relative to the GT7 version up the hill. This is where neither car had the torque to maintain their speed, but the GT7 Supra maintained more of its speed and all things being equal, that means that it must have more torque. Then, once coming down the hill, the engine is only fighting with aerodynamics and the GT Sport Supra pulls ahead again. Of course, this is all just speculation. We need more data and of course, that just means another test. Here we are hitting 300 in both cars and just slamming on the brakes. Just as in the first test we are in automatic to simply stop manual shifting interfering with our test results. Both cars stop at the exact same time. So much for the tire grip theory then. If the grip were different between GT Sport and GT7 then we would see it in the stopping distance. Or would we? Maybe the braking test isn't sensitive enough and besides, there is more than one way to measure tire grip. Let's take this to a real track. This is Sakuba, GT Sport vs GT7, same car, same track, same driver, can't tell them apart, here you go. I have cut the corners together to keep it in sync and if you watch closely you are going to notice a pattern. The braking points are generally the same and the apex speeds aren't that different either, but I get on the power earlier in GT7, which is surprising to me. It's not 100% throttle though, I am feathering it, slowly squeezing the throttle to gently bring in the power. Whereas in GT Sport, I'm gentle for just a little bit, then I'm smashing it. Do that in GT7 and you'll be doing donuts in no time, but in GT Sport, the car just deals with it. By the end of that lap, all the traction on every turn exit adds up to a 2 second gap between the games. That is a huge difference in grip and makes it easy to see why GT7 feels so different from GT Sport. This one image alone can tell you all you need to know. On the left is the point where I was able to go full throttle in GT Sport. On the right is the point where I was able to do the same in GT7. The difference is just night and day. In the build up to release, Polyphony Digital made some noise about the dynamic environments and aerodynamics. But it's always the same claims every release. This time though, they just might have delivered, at least on the wind. New to GT7 is this little guy. 
a wind speed and direction indicator. In theory, this is going to alter your speed depending on the direction and strength of the wind. But something else in this Supra has caught my eye. Enhance. What we have here on the dash is a temperature gauge. A working temperature gauge. Makes me wonder what else is lurking in dashboards, but for now, let's test the temperature. On the left is a run at 12.9C and on the right is a run at 5C higher, 17.9. But as you might be already thinking, this is a null result. The runs are near identical and why would we expect anything less? The difference in temperature is tiny and while warmer temperatures might be better for the tires, it's worse for the engine. And the wind speed isn't identical between the runs either, which is an issue that's going to need to be solved before any further testing on how temperature affects times in GT7 can be done. Currently, it's possible to select weather in custom events, but you cannot control wind speed and the temperature range itself is disappointing, with the hottest weather being under 20 and the coldest being just under 8C, at least according to what I've found so far. If we could select, say, Bathurst at 0 and 40, then we would really have something. Till then though, we still have the wind. And I'm happy to confirm that this one does indeed work as advertised. The time on the left is a run with a 4.6 meters per second headwind, and on the right we have a 2.1 meters per second crosswind. All things being equal, we should see the cars very evenly matched until they start hitting higher speeds where aerodynamic drag is king. And what do you know, that's exactly what we see. As the speed climbs, so does the advantage for the car facing less of a headwind. And that isn't all. The car also has a slight tendency to get blown around by the wind. In the run you are seeing now, the car always wants to drift to the right. I literally thought my wheel might need calibration till I noticed. Oh, that's the direction the wind is blowing. Nice work, Polyphony Digital. We are still not finished with this test track though. There's one more thing I want to test here and that is fuel weight. Does it matter at all? In the real world, it can matter quite a bit. But is it even modelled in GT7? Well, of course, on screen is your answer. On the right is our Mini Cooper with our full tank of petrol and on the left is that exact same Mini Cooper with half a tank. At first the car with less fuel accelerated harder gaining a lead but when aerodynamics became the limiting factor both cars began to top out at about the same speed. Beyond 170 both cars were very evenly matched. Now we have already seen how tuning can affect cars in a previous video on the channel but something else about tuning in GT7 that has caught my fascination is tire width and wide body kits. What you are seeing here is a stock Mini Cooper on the left and a Mini on the right that has wide rims, whatever they are. They really don't seem like they do anything at all, and this test confirms my suspicions. Corner by corner, the lap is identical and both cars cross the line within three one hundredths of a second of each other. That's metronomic driving precision right there. So, wide rims then? On their own, they appear to do nothing, but what happens when you combine those wide rims with the wide body modification? Again, on the right is the wide body car in the Formula Digital livery and on the left is the stock Mini. There really isn't much in it, margins are paper thin here. It doesn't feel like the dramatic change that it is, but it is a dramatic change. Take a look at this shot. It's easy to see the wider tires under those ridiculous arches. And of course, wide tires means more grip. Corner by corner, the extra grip the wide tires brings to the table adds up and by the end of the lap, the wide body modification has gained us a quarter of a second over the stock time, which isn't bad at all. But honestly, some cars just look so cool with the wide body. I'd take it even if it just were cosmetic. So what have we learned here? Probably just what we already instinctively knew at the beginning. GT7's tyre model clearly has less grip than GT Sports does, but that isn't quite the whole picture. The reduction in grip appears to be most felt laterally. The difference in grip under straight line acceleration and braking isn't nearly as pronounced as it is while doing the same while turning. And we can confirm the wind model is real and working, as are fuel loads. Temperature though, that's still unknown and will require more investigation. If done right, we should expect a little more power when it's cold and maybe more grip when it's warm, depending on the tire. But that's a test for another day. For now, let's all hope that PD can deliver us online racing modes that this game clearly deserves, so we can play around with this new physics model PD has delivered us.